Welcome back to another episode of your favorite podcast, Deke to Deke. In this episode, I sit down with former Wake Forest running back, John Leach. John and I talk about his experience at Wake Forest, what it was like to rush for a school record 329 yards in one game, plus much, much more. Take a listen. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, go Deeks. Cool. So, John Leach, uh, this is your first time on Deke to Deke. So, uh, welcome. And we want to kind of get your story and start from the beginning. So, talk about where you're from and what it was like growing up. Uh, Kevin, you know, I'm from Garner, North Carolina, the metropolis <laughs> of Garner, North Carolina. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't a metropolis when I was coming up. Um, of course, I grew up. Um, I didn't know I was going to be a football player, Kevin. To tell you the truth, um, yeah. I grew up running track. Okay. I grew up, um, that's, that was my first sport. I always tried to play football um, after track season, but mm -hmm. every time my dad took me to Pop Warner practice, told me, hey, it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> he gave my stats. It's too late. It's too late. So I was a track guy. I mean, I played in the backyard with my friends and everything, and um, – mm -hmm. You know, one of the stories that one of my buddies used to tell me said, John John, they call me John John. I'm going, okay. John John, every time we tackle you, you know, I, was, I always play with the older kids. Every time we tackle you, we pick you up and your legs will still be moving. Something <laughs> like that. Still be moving. I said, oh, okay. I did. All right, whatever. But, you know, it was, um, it was a very special, um, I would say, group of guys that I um, grew up with. Um, we all just, you know, you know, we were, were little. We had to be outside, you yeah. know. Those guys just yeah. kind of grew me up. Um, they uh, showed me the ropes. Um, and I would say growing up in Garner, it was so close-knit. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it was a small town. It's not small anymore, but it was small back then. And, you know, everybody knew everybody, you yeah. know. I mean, I had family that was right up the street. Um, and my parents grew up with other parents, you know, in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. Smith Drive. We used to have a ball on Smith Drive. And, you know, and that, that, that's how I was raised, man. Raised with family, <laughs> raised with people that I already knew that, you know, they supported me all mm -hmm. the way up to like, you know, I was in college or, you know, went up to CFL, they supported me there. I had a support system that they ran pretty deep. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I cherish my Garner days, you know, we won a state championship, you know, at Garner in 87, I was a sophomore in high school. So let me back up. So I, I went out for football my eighth grade year and I quit. I quit because I wasn't used to getting hit. So when you're coming from track <laughs> to football, yeah. you know, that's like, you know, I'm, I played backyard football. I wasn't getting hit like that. I didn't have no pass. <laughs> just us wrestling each other to the ground. Yeah. So my eighth grade year, I mean, I remember, <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you this story, <laughs> but I remember I would go to practice and I forget something each day. So one day I forgot my cleats. So coach said, oh. you sit out. The next day, I forgot my help. Uh, well, I keep forgetting things. Oh, I don't know, coach. Last day, I forgot my shoulder pads. And I told my mom, I said, I'm not going back. And my dad was like, okay, I got something for you. So previous to that, I was working the tobacco field at the track. So I worked in tobacco field and then up until school. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry for interrupting. You got to back that up a little bit. You got to <laughs> back that up a little bit you have to be the first guest to ever talk about working in a tobacco field yes Ken. i started working in tobacco field i think i was might have been 11 or 12 years old and wow. i worked yeah that worked we worked in the tobacco field me and my cousin chris and we worked in tobacco field for like three four years and i remember that's how we got our money for our school clothes and stuff mm -hmm. like that you know but that was part of having that worth ethic you know that's what my dad wanted to teach me so when I quit football eighth grade year he said okay you got to go back to the tobacco field and I was like I don't, I don't have no problems with that I'll go back 
Wait a wait a minute that. now. I'm from I'm from Laurenburg. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And small town, rural town, you never look forward to going into the tobacco field, but right. you look forward to that versus that is, yeah. playing football. Playing football, I got hit so hard, I was like, man, I can't do this. <laughs> I really work in tobacco. Had field. to be a hard hit. He <laughs> sent a brother back to well, the tobacco you, field. Right. <laughs> yeah, he put the coach put me back at punt return. You know, he knew I was. I didn't know what I was doing. He put me at punt return, and the guys were coming down full speed. I'm catching the ball. I don't know anything about fair catching, and they teeing off on me. Like, what in the world? You know, I was like, what are they doing? What's going on here? This ain't what I see on television, bro. You know, this ain't what the NFL. So I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna get out of this. Okay. But when I did go back, my best friend who lived around the corner named Keith Evans, mm -hmm. he went with me to work in the tobacco field. We was working. And uh, my uncle Walter, that's who I worked for, my uncle Walter. And Keith, he couldn't keep up. He was a little slow. So my uncle okay. Walter got off the tractor one time and yelled at Keith and kicked him in the butt. So Keith dropped the tobacco, went back to the uh <laughs> to the barn, tobacco barn house sat down, waited for me, and said, man, I'm going out for football. You should come out for football. I said, man, I already did that. I ain't going to do that. He said, man, come on out. Come on out. So long story short, he got me out there. I um, started playing wide receiver. Cause I was like, man, I ain't getting back here. Just running back, no punt return. I'm, I'm going to stay out here wide receiver. I can play that. So uh, I played wide receiver. That's how I got started ninth grade. I started wide receiver. I run my corner route, touchdowns, and then next thing you know, uh, they put me at running back and the rest was history. I started at running back my ninth grade year and, and went on up to my senior year until I got the wake. Now you played at uh, Garner. Uh, was it Garner Senior High School or just Garner right. High? Garner Senior High. So Garner Senior High had one of the better programs in North Carolina. Not quite as good as, as Scotland High School, but it, <laughs> it was a good program. <laughs> Now you guys won, you talked about winning the state championship yeah, yeah. and were you on that? Was Anthony Barber also on that team? Yes, Anthony Barber was on that team. Um, we had, uh, whew, man, we had Anthony Barber. We had uh, Robert Hinton who played at NC state uh, for uh, football. We had Stacy Betts, who was our starting quarterback. These are all upperclassmen, um, but Anthony. Yeah. You know, until I got, you know, kind of stepped back and looked at what we had at Garner, mm -hmm. Anthony was the truth. Okay. And his demeanor, his work ethic, oh man, it was, it was a, above all, you know, he wasn't a vocal leader. He was a leader. He showed you how to practice, you know, okay. the way Anthony ran in the football games, Anthony ran in practice. So I, I mean, I'm young. Mm -hmm. playing organized football for the first time in my ninth grade year, I see this guy, I need to emulate what he's doing. Great guy. Score a touchdown, get the ball right to the referees, just like Barry Sanders. So I seen yeah. him. I seen his incredible runs and people be in, in awe, but it was something that we saw every day. So it was like, that's what we expected him to do. Yeah. So as a sophomore, I played linebacker. So I started at linebacker as a sophomore in high school on that state championship team. And I played some fullback. I never played tailback. I played some fullback. We had a guy by the name of Chris Dorman who was in front of me, who was a, a great, great athlete in himself. Um, he never did anything, but he was a great, great football player, tough as nails. Um, but I played behind him. So I learned from Anthony, I learned from Chris. And then when my opportunity came, I, you know, I, I took advantage of it. But learning from Anthony Barber and see him, man, that was so, just good. So in high school, you played. So you come in and you, you're playing wide receiver first. And yep. then you get switched to linebacker. When did yep. you go to – when did you move to running back? And what was that transition like for you? Uh, making that change to another position that was the position that ran you out of the game the first time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How did you um, embrace that again? Um, I embraced it where um, you making me tell my stories, man. <laughs> so when I was at wide receiver, we had a guy by the name of Greg McCallop. He 
played, he was a starting running back on JV. So I, I was on JV. Okay. So he got pulled up to varsity midway through the season. And Coach Wolf, um, he came to me, he said, hey, we want to try you out at running back. I said, okay. Well, so I remember he said, I'm going to put you on kickoff return. So, you know, get used to running the ball, whatever. That's okay. Put me on kickoff return. And Coach Wolf, so I'm going to back up. Coach Wolf always told me, he said, John, John, you need to learn how to run low. You need to get, get your pads low. You need to learn how to do that. You're running like a track guy. You're not a track guy anymore. When you step on the football field, you become a football guy. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, whatever. I, you know, in one end, out the other. Went Millbrook game, caught a um, kickoff return. Kevin, I'm running up the sideline. And I'm running up the sideline in track form. Oh. This guy from Millbrook came and knocked me up under the bleachers, bro. Up on, I mean, right across the field, up under the bleachers. And our Coach Wolf came over to me and looked. He said, I bet you get low now. I said, yeah, you're right. So from that point right there, you know, I was on the bench. You know, yeah, I got myself good. together. He said, now let's get in the game and run the ball. And the rest was history. I got the ball. I kept my pads low. And I was fast back then. You know, I got slower as I got older. because I we didn't all? Stretch, probably, whatever. But, you know, the rest was history. He put the ball in my hands, and I just kind of outran guys. And I really used my skills that I learned, you know, in backyard football. You know, you play mm -hmm. in pools. You don't want to get, you know, tackled. You want to try to avoid everything. And that's what I did um, yeah. at, at Millbrook. So I think I played like four or five games running back. And, you know, at that time, JV, I was scoring whenever they got me the ball. So I just wow. to run everybody. So what was your recruiting process like uh, during that time? And what was it about Wake that separated it from the other schools for you to make that decision to, to come to Wake? Again, you're coming from uh, a storied program. You yeah, yeah. won a state championship. You played other positions. So you understood the game from a broader perspective. Right. So what was it, again, that separated Wake and what was your uh, overall recruiting process like? My recruiting process, man, I remember my sophomore year, we was playing Roxborough person. And I remember Anthony got hurt. I went in and played fullback. They called a play for me scored on the very next play. Um, and we beat Roxborough pretty handily. And I was walking off, jogging off after the game. And I remember, uh, I think it was an NC State coach that said, John, John, you got a scholarship to State. I said, oh, okay. So I knew. So State was yeah. recruiting. Um, other programs didn't come in until later on. Um, mm -hmm. I think weight came in probably around my eyes senior year um a t uh Fayetteville state i didn't re get recruited by a whole bunch of people i mean not a lot of colleges um maryland came in at the very end maryland i'll tell you this story so maryland came in i was at south Garner park it's a park that we used to play ball at uh -huh. I mean, we, we'd be getting it in kid um and i remember my coach nelson smith brought this recruiter up from Maryland, and apparently they played football together at ECU. He was a lineman, and Coach Smith was a lineman. So they called me over, John, John, come here. I went over there to the car. He said, this is Coach so-and-so. He's from Maryland. They, they want you to come up for a visit. I said, oh, yeah, sure. No problem. So um, he said, I'll give you a call with all the specifics. I said, that's no, no problem. So they called me like a couple of days later. Hey, John, we, um, we got you set up, man. We got your airless. <laughs> Airline ticket, man. Got your hotel and stuff ready for you. I said, what, 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 what airline ticket? What, what you talking about? <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to fly you up. I said, man, I ain't getting on no plane, man. <laughs> I said, don't worry about the visit, man. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I blew that chance because I ain't want to get on the plane. So, but... <laughs> Well, now Maryland is going to play into another big game in your life. And we'll right. talk about that. We'll talk right. about that. Exactly. Uh, but uh, so now you're scared of planes and blew your chance. Blew my chance. Um, but 
Coach Skip Stress recruited me at Wake. And I remember that process. And I was like, I've never heard of Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. So I went to a Duke Wake Forest game. And I was, Duke was recruiting me as well. But by this time, Steve Spurrier is near to leave and head to Florida. But I went to a Duke Wake Forest game. And I remember seeing Ricky Pro. Okay. And I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. This dude is bad, man. Yeah. I was like, oh, I said, Wake Forest is not bad. He's going to be there too? Oh, man, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I got excited, you know, it's, it's Wake Forest. And, you know, I ended up going, you know, for my official visit. And uh, me and Coach Dooley talked for a, a good little while. And uh, he said, what you think about coming to Wake Forest? I said, um, I think I like that, Coach. I think I like that. But in my mind, I was you know, just telling, hey, I, I like the whole process. You know, mm -hmm. we came up, man, when we come to Wake Forest, they took us to Staley's yeah. Steakhouse. Yeah. Man, they, they did it up, you know. And then, you know, I didn't know anything about the academics at that time, you know, mm -hmm. how, you know, Wake Forest is like the Ivy League of the South. Mm -hmm. And then me going, going to, you know, for that visit and meeting some of the, some of the professors, um, just some of the faculty, you know, some of the, just some of the people that was there, it was all inviting, it was small, you know, mm -hmm. and it's something that, you know, that I could, that's what I like, you know, I like the one-on-one, -on -one. I like the personals, the personal touches and things like that. That's what, to me, was weight, it was a personal touch. And it was a very familiar thing because it reminded me of Garner. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was so close knit. Everybody. I mean, I wasn't going to an NC State. I went to NC State when I went to visit on NC State. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, okay, they they put my jersey up, you know, whatever. But it was a whole lot of people on campus, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and you didn't see, but maybe a quarter of the campus where with Wake Forest. I got to walk the whole campus. I saw everything and everything was right there, centralized where you could touch. Yeah. To me, you could just reach out and touch. And it was just that, it just it just felt home to me. And I, I, I tell people all the time, whenever you go to Wake Forest, um, we are few and far between when it comes to alumni. But when you go back, you're home. You know, and you feel so good at Wake Forest because you're back home. You know, a lot, yeah. a lot of guys, you know, we try to get together every once in a while, but when we do, it's like we never left. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's 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 one of the things I, I took pride in being at Wake is, you know, it was just a, it was truly a family affair. Yeah. It was a family affair. So and then they took care of it. That's awesome, man. So when you get to Wake your freshman year, how were you able to make that transition? And what were some of the uh, difficulties or some of the, re what are some of the people that helped you get through that freshman year? Because again, I understand sort of what you went through as well, coming from a small town. Now you're going to a larger area, you're playing major college sports, you've got the academic rigors you're having to deal with. What are some of the resources? Who are some of the people that helped you get through and adjusted that first year? And what are some of the, the, the things that, you know, some of the challenges you may have faced? Well, I, I would say the first challenge was um, getting on campus and, <laughs> It was, uh, you know, summer, you know, we got there August, I think it's August 15th, still summer. And we go through winter workout, not winter workout, summer workouts. The challenge for me was I wasn't in shape and they got me in shape. Um, Dooley and his guys got me in shape and I wasn't used to that. Um, that was one of the, the, one of the, the first hurdle I had to cross over was Okay, not at Garner anymore. You're in college. Let's get in shape. I struggled big time. I mean, I, I was faking hyperventilating. I was just trying to get out <laughs> of all of that. Um, but then the next hurdle was the academics. We talked about it. 
you know, and it was just getting used to the academics and getting used to being on a structured, a, a structured schedule because, you know, we had breakfast check. We had to be there by 7.30. We had to have an eight o'clock class, class all the way up to about 12, 12, 15, one. Then you have meetings. Then you getting taped, you getting all these things. So I had to get used to, to that regiment of, um, you know, that my day is planned for me. And then after practice, you study hall. So I can say that some of the people that helped me uh, transition to that, Doug Bland, the academic advisor, yeah. uh, Mike Protopis, yeah. he, was, he was working at the academic. He really, they, they really helped me um, kind of, uh, okay, John, come on in. Let's get you, let's get you balanced here. And those guys really stepped in um, because they gave me classes that I could handle. And then the classes that I needed from my major, they made sure that I kind of transitioned into those kind of fairly pretty easily. But mm -hmm. I had to learn how to, to, to really just control the load that I did have, you know, because when yeah. you take them, a full load at Wake Forest, it's not, I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult. Um, yeah. So they really helped me out. Doug Bland and, and, and Mike Protopoulos really helped me out uh, when I was a freshman coming in. So once I learned how to do it as my freshman year uh, came to an end, sophomore, junior, and senior year, it kind of, it was a little bit easier. I know what to do, but they really helped, they helped, really helped me transition pretty well. So you get to Wake and you're in the ACC. What was the ACC in terms of football and the talent? Uh, what was it like during that era? Oh, man. Any given Saturday. You yeah. Know, um, you're playing against the, the Carolinas, the NC States, the Dukes, um, you know, Maryland, you know, those guys. you playing against Virginia. Oh, yeah. man. It was – it was hard hitting every Saturday. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that a lot of those guys said about Wake Forest is when they came to Wake Forest or Wake Forest went to them, it was going to be a fight for four quarters. So playing in the ACC, we had some respect. People don't think we did, didn't, but we did have respect. Um, so I remember playing against Anthony Barber. You know, he's at NC yeah. State. I'm at Wake Forest. And I remember trying to block him on or trying to tackle him when I was on kickoff team and he was on the kickoff return and, you know, making a tackle on him or maybe missing a tackle and he'll let me know about it. But <laughs> it was just, you know, it was very, I mean, it was competitive each and every Saturday. I mean, there was not an easy game. I mean, I had an easy game with maybe a Western Carolina or something like that, even App State. I mean, mm -hmm. those guys come off that night. They're ready they to really play. play. Yeah. The ACC, man, it was um, it was full of talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't care what team you played. There was some talent on the team. Um, I mean, I remember playing against, um, oh man, the running back Terry Kirby from Virginia. Oh wow, yeah, man, just seeing yeah. him in person, you know, and like, yeah. Was Terry, I mean, I seen Terry Curry on TV. Look at this dude. Oh, dude tall, <laughs> big, running. Natron yeah. means, you know, yeah. Me and Natron played in the Shrine Bowl together, but just to see him on the football field and you know, Ken Swilling, oh. mm -hmm. Pat Georgia brother. Tech. Yeah, I remember. I was, you know, when I got the wake, I was like, one team I'm looking forward to playing is Ken Swilling, but I'm not looking forward to playing. Because I remember just seeing him, Sports Illustrated, these big pass, neck yeah, brace, number that. one, 235, 40 pounds coming downhill. Like, what? Yeah. No. But it was it was competitive each and every Saturday, man. It was that was that was the good ACC right there. Because you you didn't have a drop off. Yeah. You really didn't have, I mean, the talent was spread out. You didn't have a drop off. And um, and then when Florida State came in, whoo, wow! Yeah, we we uh we played against some of those Florida State teams. Yes. Uh, but John, I want to ask you about being on that Independence Bowl team, right? Mm -hmm. 
what was that season like for you guys? Uh, because Wake had not been to a bowl in a few years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Coach Dooley was coaching that team. What was that like to be a part of that team and kind of talk about what that season was like in your bowl experience? Mm, good question, Kev. Um, that season was magical. Yeah. And I say that because the first four games, we, we lost. We lost the first four, and then we went on a, a seven. I think, no, the first three, we went on a seven-game winning streak. But Coach Dooley came in and let us know that, hey, this is my last year. And just want to let you guys know. And that was like the light switch that turned everything on. I mean, our defense started playing well. Offense started playing well. I remember that year, um, I got hurt. So we played, I think we played App State, we played NC State, and then we played Virginia. And I remember I was running and I went out of bounds on our home side. And there was like a sidewalk that still kind of raised up a little bit, hit my shin on it, stress oh. fracture. So I don't play. So Ned Moultrie goes in. And that's when we hit the hot streak. You know, we are winning and I'm and I'm I'm playing still, but I'm playing just to run pass routes, yeah. catch the ball out the backfield, because at that time, that's what I mean, I was the only one that could do it. Um, so Dooley, <laughs> I remember I said, Dooley, I, I, Coach Dooley, I don't think I can play, man. I'm 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 hurt my leg. He said, John Leach, I don't care if you 50 percent, you got to play. <laughs> So, I mean, I was out there limping, you know, probably about, I mean, I want to say for the remaining season, yeah. the time of the season. I mean, I, I went out there limping, but Ned had a great year. Ben Coleman came mm -hmm. out of nowhere, had a great year. Um, Mitch Kennedy, Wendell Wells, those guys had great years. John Henry had a great year. And then the defense. Everybody on the defense, man. I mean, they played like it was, it, it was, it was like poetry in motion. I mean, you had Maurice Miller, Mike McQuarrie on the ends, Dread Boo, Jay Williams in the center. You had Kevin Giles, who was a sophomore um, playing yeah, linebacker. So, yeah. Yeah. Playing linebacker. One of the best in the ACC. Uh, you had um, Scott. A shell hammer, another linebacker. He was a senior. Man, he ran that defense. Then you had Good Pasture, who was a sophomore. He would knock you out. And mm -hmm. then we had our defense, George Carr here, Ron Lambert, and um, and Mr. Lamont Scales. Yeah. Man, that that was like all ACC on that defense. And man, and they played well that year. And like I said, it was a dream season because everything came into effect. The only thing. It wasn't a dream for me is that I got hurt. And okay. I remember I, I just, I wasn't playing. I, I need to go in. I want to, I want to touch the ball more, but I couldn't, but I did do it in a way where it benefited the team. Okay. And Ned, okay. And Ned, I mean, he turned it out. I mean, he had a great season and just getting to the bowl game, I healed up and had a great bowl game. You know, yeah, you rush for what is it, uh, one fifteen, one twenty, yeah, somewhere along in there. Some yards, and you know, had a couple touchdowns, yeah. had a, a long run. But Todd Dixon, I didn't even mention him. Yeah. Todd Dixon was man, talking about an athlete, bro. Yeah, Todd, four three forty, probably forty inch vertical, and will beat a DB up and down the field. Yeah. I mean, he basically beat Clemson by himself our junior year. He basically wow. beat Clemson because he, he made some catches that was, oh, man. <laughs> but that, that team was, that's a, that was a special team. That was a special team. We had some some characters on that team. But when it's time, <laughs> I've heard, to, play I've on, heard. Yeah, <laughs> time to play on Saturday, we all came together and we played for one cause. And that was really, we're going to win for Coach Dooley because we didn't want him to go. I didn't yeah. want him to go. You know, he recruited me out of high school. You know, he recruited me in the offense that was three yards in the cloud of dust. That's what I did at Garner. 
you know, mm-hmm. so I'm, like, I'm, I'm fitting right in. And then when he said he had to leave, I mean, the guys just really rallied. And the senior class of that group, they rallied, picked us up. Let's do this. Let's go out on top for Coach Dillon. That's exactly what we did. What type of coach was he to be so well respected and revered for the players that they just they stepped it up and and went to another level just for him? What was it like playing for him? He was a player's coach. He would take care of you. Um, no matter what you needed, he's right there. Uh, he was right there. Um, I remember just. <laughs> I remember um, taking a couple classes one time and I took a mom class. I don't know if you, if, <laughs> if you ever took that. Professor Dotting was yep, his Professor name. Professor Dotting, yeah. Who was a world renowned momist. Yep. And I remember I took that class and we had to do our skits at the end and I did my skit. And Professor Dotting was like, yes, John Leach, yes. That was awesome. He said, I would mind taking you over to. England and doing some studying. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you talk to Coach Dillard, Coach Dillard, hey, uh, Professor Dottie will take me to England and do a, like an understudy, you know, maybe for a semester. And he easily said, you're on a football scholarship, son. And <laughs> I said, well, okay, Coach Dillard. He said, I say that because you have something great in you as a football player. He said, I see you. Mm-hmm. One day, hopefully playing on Sundays, I said, but you can't get distracted. You know, yeah. your major is something else. Your major is not mine. Your mm-hmm. major is not theater arts. Your major is your major with sociology. Then yeah. at the same time, you need to be here to make sure you polish your skills, hone your skills on what you want to do, you know, once your football career is over. And he said that in to me in a loving way. Yeah. You know? And yeah. that's what Cook does. He was he was that he was that father, almost almost like that grandfather mm-hmm. that has so much wisdom. So much. And he coached some great folks. He coached Lawrence Taylor. Yeah. He coached Bruce Smith. You know, he coached these guys. So he knew what it took to get to the next level if that's where you was trying to go but he can also be that father figure and just kind of talk you off the ledge, if you will. Yeah. So uh, Coach Dooley left. Yeah. Um, and Coach Caldwell comes in, who mm-hmm. in a lot of ways was the exact opposite. You're talking younger. Uh, his first head coaching job, he had not been a, you know, a head coach before at that level. Mm-hmm. And what was it like playing for Coach Caldwell? Okay. <clears throat> the first day he got into the office and we had our meeting and he was introduced. He came up to the podium and he used 12, 13 letter words <laughs> that we didn't, you know, we looking at each other like, man, what is he talking about, man? And after he finished, he said, I just want to let you guys know, I have a master's in English. I do this. I coach football because I have a love for the game. I can go do anything else that I want to do, but I'm coaching this because I have love for the game. That's where you should be looking at this game. You should have love for the game. So I'm going to work you guys hard. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to love you in a way that I'm going to prepare you to be better men. Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, okay, what are we going to get into? Man, that man had us on the track field doing 800s. Eight. I think one day we did like five 800s. I mean, we on the track field running 800s and we be in time. And then I remember it snowed. We was up the next morning running the 5k around campus when and i remember it. it was so cold outside i i got bronchitis i'm like man this this dude is crazy yeah man i didn't <laughs> yeah. you know i we, mean we had that winter conditioning with him yeah he had it with him see yes, you guys got uh, it early 
But we yes. got it once he was good and seasoned at Wake. Once he was good and seasoned and learned the campus and the weather patterns. Yes. Yeah, that's, he gave it to us too. Those those cold February mornings at at five thirty six a.m. Yeah, yeah, we got yeah, it. He um, you know, yeah. he brought the fourteen forty test. Did y'all ever do the fourteen forties? Uh, we oh. heard about it. He changed it to the yeah. I think he changed it up. with us. Yeah. So of course, you know, when we have pro timing day, as they call it, everybody's trying to run their fastest forty. Yeah. So the 1440 test was you had to do 1440s. I think for wide receivers, DBs, and running backs, they added 0.4 seconds to your 40 time. So I ran a 4.5, so I had to run 4.9 in all 1440s. So you would run the 40, Kevin. You had 25 seconds to jog back, get to the start line, and run your 40 again and do it within four nine, all 14 of them. That's the hardest test ever. I mean, I yeah. put some kids on it that said, Oh, I run 40. I said, Hey man, nah. you how fast you run? I run this. I said, Okay, let's let's do it. Let's do this 14. Man, they get to number six and they run like six, seven forty. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Now, man, now us, I'm not saying the 110 test was harder. But what? I've seen a I've seen a lot of guys go down from the 110 test. We had to do we had 16 110s we had to oh, run. Wow. And that was the first day of camp. So uh, yes, that, yes. Yeah. So you had yeah. to show up that first day and that morning you got up early, went to the practice field, and you got tested. And so I ran with the linebackers. Oh. And you know, we had our time, but I saw a lot of guys get taken out. As we used to call it, they got the gunshot in the back. You know, when you're holding your back and you start that duck water right around number yes. nine or number yes. two. Yes. <laughs> and then the strategy kicks in. The strategy, yeah. you got to strategize. Yes. And you were allowed to miss two. You had to make 14 out of the 16. Oh. And so the best thing is make the first 14. Man, I've seen guys not make the first two and they had mm. to hit. Oh. It got bad, but yeah, he he was, yeah, he was a sticker for care. being in shape. He Andre, really was. Andre Mason, Big Dre, Andre Mason. Yeah, I know. Him. Andre was cross, crossing the finish line with his hand out like this. <laughs> <laughs> and and look here, it just had to be a body part, and he would he would make it. Big Dre was struggling. I mean, we all struggled, man. And you know, yeah. but Coach Carr, that was the best. Probably the best shape I was in my whole college career. Yeah, and that. and even as a person, he got you yeah. in shape as a person. Yes, he did. He he's yeah. man, you talking about uh, Coach Carwell <clears throat> came to me, um, brought me to his office, and was talking about, hey, this is what I'm going to run. This type of offense, we're going to go to a one back system. He said, John, uh, you're going to be a running back, but sometimes you're going to move to R which is a receiver. Um, Todd, we're going to put you at the R because you're wasted out <laughs> outside. We're going to bring you in. We need to get you the ball more. Talking to Ned. And then, you know, I was like, he's changing our offense, guys. Mm -hmm. How are we going to adapt to this? He's changing our offense. He didn't care. Yeah. What he was going to do, he's going to go out there. He's going to, let, let's play. We're going to play 60 minutes. You know, mm -hmm. the reason why I gave you this 1440 test, because I want you to be in shape. We're going to play 16, 60 minutes. He knew that a new offense that was coming in, it was going to take a while for the guys to get, get acclimated. To yeah. Because yeah. What, what, what we're used to, we used to three yards in the cloud. Those used to a fullback, a tailback, mm -hmm. in the eye, running sweet right, sweet left, uh, isolation, things of that nature. But he changed up the whole landscape. And a lot of guys didn't, they didn't like that, you know. Yeah. A yeah. lot of guys, they, you know, they's like, no, nah, we can't do this, you know. And, of course, I, I became, you know, I'm Carl Will's boy. Because I didn't, I was out there trying to play football. I yeah. I, if I needed a fullback, fine. If I don't, fine. I'm just out here to play football. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it, 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 didn't, it didn't go over too well for some of the guys. <laughs> well, speaking of Carl Will and being in shape and being having to play for 60 minutes, I want to talk about a very special game. 
And you you mentioned earl, uh, earlier about not flying to uh, Maryland on a recruiting visit. Right. And so the a special date is November 20th, 1993. Mm. And on that day, you broke the single game rushing record with 329 yards. All right. So I want to ask you about that game in particular. What was your mindset going into that game? And was the game plan, again, you've got this offense from Coach Caldwell, mm -hmm. was the game plan to just feed you the ball or did it just evolve into that? Kind of let Deacon Nation, you know, into what was going on that week leading up to that game. Well, that week leading up to the game, I remember Coach Caldwell came to me in practice. He said, hey, John, you need 200 and I think 40 something yards to get a thousand. I'm gonna get you a thousand. Now, fast rewind. The whole year, I think I might have carried the ball a total of, you know, per game, the highest total, maybe 20, 20 times. Okay. That's a um, lot of totes, though. That's a pretty good number but, of totes. Yeah, 20. Yeah, but I mean, to get 249 yards and oh, 20 okay. totes. You know, I was like, oh, okay, okay, Coach Caldwell, we'll see, we'll see. Um, but he came to he came to me and he told me that's what he was going to do, and I really didn't. Be honest, I really didn't believe it because I was like, you know, once we get in the game, the you know, the game is going to dictate what we're going to do. You yeah. know, it might not be uh, running the ball; it might be we have to throw the ball a hundred times or whatever. So. We, um, he tells me that we go through our, our practice and then we get to game. And I remember the first time I touched the ball, I lost two yards. And that was in the first quarter. At that time, we didn't run the ball. We, we started throwing it. I mean, I caught a couple of passes out the backfield, ran a couple of times. Second quarter is when it really started because at that time, I'm getting the ball. I'm getting like you know maybe six, seven yards a pop, eight yards. Might pop one for fifteen, um, and it was to tell you the truth, cat. I don't, I don't know if I was in a zone or if, if that's what you want to call it, but I know that I was having a decent game. Um, and we fast forward to the beginning of the fourth quarter. So third quarter ends i come to the sideline and i'm jogging off and ned motri comes to me he said hey you got to stay in the game so wow well, he said i think you got over 200 yards i said okay i need some help you know you get in the game <laughs> said, okay he went in the game and came back out i go back in the game fourth quarter we still running the ball we're getting eight nine yards a pop running the ball running the ball um and then Towards the end of the fourth quarter, um, I hear the crowd chanting 300. So I, wasn't, I don't even know why they're doing that. So I, I ran the ball. I need to come off and give me a breather. Now Ned's like, stand there, stand there. What are you talking about? So they stop us. We put the ball to them. We stop them. And I'm thinking that Ned's going to go in. Mm -hmm. He said, no, uh, he said, no, you you go in. I said, what's going on? He said, you almost got 300 yards rushing. I was like, what? Ain't no way. I didn't think I had that many carries. I mean, by the time the game was over, I got 46 carries. So I remember Jeez. going in. We've got, I think we got the ball on the 35-yard line. And we run every play to get to the one-yard line. Coach Caldwell calls a timeout, and I'm thinking, okay, it's fourth and one. We don't, we don't drove maybe about, probably about 12, 13 play drive. Got down there, fourth and one. I'm thinking we're gonna kick the field goal. We kick the field goal, we will win the game. But Coach Caldwell's like, we're running the ball so well, let's go for this. So it's fourth and one. We don't get it. Maryland drives 99 yards. Scores a touchdown, beat us by one point. And I remember at the news conference, you know, somebody asked me, hey, John, 
you got, you know, you broke the ACC rushing record, 229 yards. How do you feel? The first thing that came out of my mouth, Kevin, was, I really don't feel good because we just lost the game. I mean, mm. regardless of the record, you know, we lost the game. That was an individual record. I'm, you know, after it was all said and done, after the game was over, I mean, I was like, man, I broke, I broke Derek Finner's record. And what makes that so special, I remember watching Derek Finner set that record against Virginia in 80, I want to say it's like 86. I saw Derek oh, wow. Finner break that record against Virginia and not think, what, seven years from that point, I would break his record. And I watched him do it because I was a Derek Finner fan. I love to watch Derek Finner run. He ran hard. Yeah. And it was it was it was a great, I mean that that record stood for like twenty years. Yeah, it stood for 20, a long. I mean, it stood for a long time. It it's not hard. Time. That's hard to when you when you're talking about three hundred yards rushing in a single game, yeah. and it took you. You mentioned how many carries? Forty six carries. Forty six carries. Yeah, you 46. know that's that's a lot of a, a lot of pounding. How long did it take for you to physically recover from? You know, running the ball that much was it just a did, was it just a quick turnaround for you, or did you need a couple of days to get it together? Uh, I think it was a quick turnaround because I want to say um, on Monday I was on the basketball court playing basketball at Reynolds. Okay, so you can do that when you're in your early twenties and <laughs> right, and exactly. Yeah, you so you know, yeah. hey, tobacco okay. field taught me something. It, it taught my body. <laughs> you taught my body. You can recover. I like that. So you, you know, and um. I was thinking about that record. So a total of yardage of that game for me was 411 yards, all purpose yards, wow. 411. And I remember two years after that record was set, somebody from Clemson broke it. Yeah. They had 415 yards. Yeah. Uh, and it was a wide receiver, I think it was. Yeah. But 411 yards, I remember I, I caught up some passes. And I returned one punt for nine yards because Coach Caldwell, another thing about him, he always asked me, why do you fair catch on the punts? Because Todd Dixon got hurt, so I had to go back there and catch punts. Uh -huh. And I supposed to return them. No, I'm, I'm fair catch. <laughs> why do you do that? <laughs> so he sent me in, you better not fair catch. So I caught the punt. I ran for probably about nine yards. So I'm, like, I'm good, all right. I think you need to get Roger Pettis in the game, though, because I, I don't like to return a punt stuff, coach. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Uh, so when you talk about your career at Wake mm -hmm. and you spent some time in the CFL, how was that transition for you coming from Wake and then now you're the pro level? Right. What was that transition for you? Oh, how that transition, that? it was almost like – it was almost – like coming out of high school, going to Wake Forest. Okay. Uh, because when I came to came out of high school, coming to Wake Forest, I would told myself, I'm not going to get registered. I want to play immediately. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what I did. I, I played as a true freshman. So when I went from Wake Forest to Canada, I said, I mean, I want to play. I want to make a name for myself. I'm going um, to do that. And um, yeah. So he, um, when I got to Canada, my first stint was the Las Vegas Posse. And uh, the Las Vegas Posse was a expansion team. Okay. And uh, the coach that was there, um, you might have heard of his name. His name is Rick Meyer. He was at SMU, and, and uh, he was one of the coaches on that team. He was the head coach. And um, okay. I remember I... I got to Las Vegas, practicing, doing, doing pretty good. That gets doing pretty well. So, but something was on my mind, Kev. I hadn't got my degree from Wake Forest. And that was in the back of my mind. I was like, man, I really want to go back. And get, I was four credits shy of Oh, graduate. wow. So I was like, man, I can go back in the summer session, get those four credits, then come back because the CFL had a long season. Mm -hmm. And so I told that coach that. 
but didn't know that Coach Meyer called the coach at Wake Forest, Coach Jerry McManus, and said, yep. thank you for sending me John Leach. Because I'm thinking if I'd have stayed, I was probably going to start or get a lot of playing time. So when that happened, um, I told him, I said, Coach, I said, Man, I think I want to go back and get my degree from Wake Forest. I'm full credit, so, she, you know, graduating. Uh, I think I want to go back. And he told me, he's like, well, it's the funniest thing. I always tell my kids this. It's the funniest thing I ever heard in my life. He said, John, I understand when your competitive juices turn to horse piss. I understand <laughs> that. <laughs> Damn. I was like, oh, wait, 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 time out. Say this. Yes. Okay, okay. Say that one more time. He said, I understand when your competitive juices turns to horse piss. <laughs> and man, that just that, that shook me to the core, kid. Because I was like, I, I was thinking, I was, I was thinking I was going to get a different reaction. I thought, hey, yes, you do need to go back and get your degree. You need yeah. to. You know, this yeah, Wake Forest is a great school. Go back and get your degree and come back. Yeah, oh, that's when I learned the business side of it. Oh, okay. okay. You know, he was like, "What have you done for me lately?" That was yeah. his attitude. So you know, yeah. I was like, man. But I decided. I said, "I'm leaving." I, mean, mm -hmm. I I got to go finish my degree, and that was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. Why because though? Next year, hmm? What, well, John, why? Why was that Wake Forest degree so important? Why was it so important to you? I think it was so important to me because I felt like I had people I had to prove that, hey, I could get this degree. Because once I left high school, I had some naysayers back in my hometown. In, in my high school, I had teachers saying, you know, you, you, you are, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make And once somebody tell me I'm not going to make it or I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that, I'm going to prove you wrong. And that's exactly what was in the back of my mind. Plus, my parents, they wanted me to, to graduate. And I was four mm -hmm. credits shy. I mean, mm -hmm. four credits. I had to do it. I, I had to. I mean, and it's such a great education. You know, it ain't like I was... And I'm not knocking technical community college or any state colleges or anything, but when you get a degree from Wake Forest, what? Yeah. I mean, I could just just bring up the name Wake Forest and everybody's smiling. Everybody it's loves a game, us. It's a game changer. It is. Everybody loves changer. Wake Forest. Nobody does not hate Wake. Everybody loves Wake Forest. Love them. You know, we don't like Sir. We don't like Carolina. We don't like Duke. But everybody mm -hmm. seemed to love us for some reason because when you get a degree from Wake Forest, you know you got a degree that you earned. And it's prestigious. Prestigious, I'm sorry. Prestigious. And it's something that you can say to anyone. I'm here to succeed. I'm here to make whatever that you want. If it's a company, if it's being a teacher, or if it's being a, a builder, or what, I'm here to make your company, I'm here to make whatever it is better. And you, know, and you can do that on the back of a Wake Forest degree because it seems like everything that Wake Forest touches <laughs> is kind of silly, but it turns to gold. You got old golden black it turns to gold and people know that you're going to work hard for them yeah you know if they hire somebody from wake Forest, they know that they're going to get the best yeah you know i mean you have the dukes you have your vanderbilts you have your rice you have your small private university but wake forest to me is that tobacco field degree it's something yeah. that you can work hard yeah. for it. each yeah. and every day and that's what that degree represents. It represents you working hard, but you got an Ivy League education at the same time. So, I mean, I, I had to come back and get it. I couldn't waste that. I couldn't, I couldn't waste that opportunity. I could have easily said, yeah, I'm going to stay. 
I go travel around Canada, you know, and, and, and not get my degree and then get it, you know, 10, 15 years later online or what? No. Something was tugging at my heart that you need to go back and get your degree. And that's exactly what I did. Man, that's that's awesome, John. I, I know you got to run, but I want to ask you a couple of more questions. One okay. is, what are some things that you learned from Wake Forest, your time there from whether it was a coach or uh, some uh, other resources that helped you? What are the things that you take from your Wake Forest experience that you still use to this day? Mm. Okay, we just talked about it. Hard work. Hard work. That's what Wake Forest taught me. It taught me how to grind. It mm. taught me how to um, be well-rounded. Yeah. Because in this, in this world today, you have to be able to rub elbows with so many people, so many facets of life, you know? And you never know who you're talking to, mm -hmm. you know? But Wake Forest, it grounded me. It gave me a foundation where I could grow into anything mm -hmm. that I want to be. Nothing was short of, you know, of how successful I wanted to be. Only I could stunt that. But yeah. Wake Forest gives you a, <laughs> it gives you a plethora of options of how to be successful. You know, yeah. I mean, I still talk to you know, um, there's um, there's some people that, that used to send us Bible verses at Wake Forest, the wow. Turners, and I, I still talk to them. You know, their children was at Wake the um, same year I was, 93, 94. One graduated in 95, but they were there. I still keep in contact with them. What's that foundation? You know, she sent us Bible. She had to do that. You know, but she, but they were hard workers. You know, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Turner, he owned Ready Mix Concrete. They were hard workers. It was nothing that was given to him. He worked hard. And so with her Bible verses and her sayings and things of that nature, um, kept us grounded, kept us humble. You know, being at mm -hmm. Wake Forest is, is practicing humility. Because you need humility in this world to succeed, you know. Oh, yeah. I don't need to, you know. If you if you go to a Wake Forest alumni or part of whatever, I don't see people with the nose up in the air, you know, yeah. looking down. You know, they looking right eye to eye, and they want to know who you are and when you graduate, and and then they find out who you are, and then they want to know about what you're doing, your kids. I mean. And then what's the next step? Then they want to help. Right. And that's what I love about it. Right. It's, it's, it creates this, it's this community and this family of, of everyone wants to help everyone become successful it's at whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, well John, I got, I want to talk to you real quick about uh, when you look back over your experience and you also see where the program is now, kind of share your thoughts on, when you look at the success that Coach Clawson has built with his players on and off the field, what are your thoughts on where the football program is at this moment? Man, this football program is in great hands. Awesome hands. Uh, Coach Clawson, man, upstanding guy. I met Coach Clawson. Well, I met Coach Clawson through a phone call. <laughs> so Naheem Hines remember that name uh, Yep. so I'm going to the Garner football game and I get a phone call it's a 336 number I said so what's the same number who, who calling me because <laughs> I had Coach, uh, Coach Faircloth on my phone I have everybody I pick up the phone and say hello John Coach Clausen here I said Coach Clausen what's, go what's going on how you doing sir so we talking and he was saying Naheem is coming up for a visit tomorrow. I need to know what he likes. I need to know what his parents like. I need to know. He was just asked, okay, I, I think I can do that, coach. But, 
and then I hung up. But I thought about it, I was like, that's a real thoughtful person. That's a real thoughtful coach. To want to get to know the intimacy of what this family might want, might need mm -hmm. uh, in their visit here. He thought to call somebody that was associated with Garner and Wake Forest to try to get those answers. A very thoughtful coach. To me, Coach Clawson gets to the heart of the matter. And that's what makes mm -hmm. him successful. He gets to the heart of the matter. So what, whatever football player that he recruits or goes through his program, they're going to leave a much better person than they came. Yeah. Because he's the type of guy that gets to the heart of the matter. I want to see what makes your heart pump. I want to make sure what let's get to the let's get to the nitty-gritty of this thing so I can build you up to be the best player that you can be. And it's shown each and every year. Yeah. 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 Dude, we won some games this year, man. Yeah. We I, yeah. kids out there, I mean, granted, different stuff has happened and you know, plays run, I don't like or whatever, but those kids play hard for each other. Yeah. And to me, he is a passionate coach that gets to the heart of the man. I haven't even had a really a, a really sit down conversation with him, but I know through recruiting because he recruited a good friend of mine's son. Mm -hmm. His name is Andre Hodge. He'll be there next year. Okay. Back 4340. Yeah. And the one thing that Andre said about Coach Clawson, he said, he makes you feel so comfortable. And at the same time, he's going to push me to be my best. That's, That's all you want the coach. That's all you ask for. That's you all you can ask you for. You want somebody that, that can make you melt in your hands, but at the same time, build you up as strong as the yeah. rock of your box. Yeah. I mean, He's that type of coach. He's we got us a good one. We got us a good one, and I and I thank God for him. I thank God that you know I can. I'm down on this end. I'm over. I'm with the NC State, the Carolina, and the and the Duke. Oh yeah, around here. But I can. I wear my Wake Forest stuff proudly. Yeah, you know they see me coming. They 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 turn the other way, care. See? <laughs> that's it wait the basketball season oh you can have yeah. it. we coming up on that end too but well, that's what i was going to say coach yeah coach, yeah, coach Ford. Ford. Have that. he's going to turn that around but yeah. coach coach Clawson, awesome class act i'm so glad we got him well john thank you so much for taking time out man to share your story and to talk about your experience of wake and the impact that it has had and just sharing your perspective, man. It's always great to catch up with you and get a chance yeah, to talk too, to man. you. But I, but real quick, John, what advice would you give uh, a kid that's thinking about Wake Forest and they want to go? At a, what 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 insight would you share with them? If a kid wanted to come to Wake Forest, I would tell him first of all, getting a class A plus, 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 plus education. You're getting a class A plus, 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 plus football education because you're being taught by one of the greatest coaches in the country. He saw that. People want him. Yeah. But he's here with us in the Wake Forest family. And I would tell a kid, Do not worry about where your friends are going or do not worry about what your high school might want you to go, you know, because you got a lot of people that persuade you. Mm -hmm. when you. Once you go to Wake Forest, look at the family that Wake Forest has built. You can ask any player Look at the family, close knit that family is. Yeah. There's, you don't hear much about 
anybody going outside of Wake Forest. I mean, you, you got the transfer portal. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all well and good. And some guys want to go test waters. That's fine. But when those guys test the waters and they go somewhere else, they shine. Because Wake Forest had gave them that foundation to build on. Yeah. They shine. But I, but if you could come to Wake Forest and you stay your four years, your five years, however long it takes you to, you'll see a much better person whenever you're at the end of the road. Yeah. You'll see a much better person. You're going to come in there as a young man and you're going to leave as a young man that's at the height of his career yeah because i think wake forest teaches that i mean you come in as a freshman you, you get red shirted they're going to bring you through the ranks where by the time you leave you're a right. class act you are a class act and that's what i would tell you. don't 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 go to these universities man that's gonna you just a number yeah Go to a university that's a that's a family, that's a strong knit family. That's gonna they're gonna hold on to you for the rest of your life. I can say that, you know, yeah. I can say that. I mean, I love coming back to Wake. I love I love coming back for the football games. I love spring football. I love to come back and just you know, it's that family. It's that yeah. family that that gets stronger and stronger. You know, might not know some of the new kids, but that that nest is that nest is casting out further and further, and bringing yeah. in that Deacon family, and it's it's, it's just tight knit. I mean, you 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 can't beat a Wake Forest family. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can't. You can't. Well, John, I appreciate it, man. And again, thanks for taking the time out to be uh, part of Deacon to Deacon to share your oh. story with Deacon Nation, man. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me, brother. I tell you, um. It's a blessing, bro. You're doing yeah. your thing, Kevin. Uh, we really appreciate you, man, and and the things you're doing for the for the Deacon, uh, the Deacon Club, and everything, man. We are uh, you're 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 an asset to the Deacon to the Deacons, man. We appreciate you.